Okay, we're going to talk about what are the stages of diabetes. And we're really talking about something called the ectopic fat theory of diabetes. And I'm going to sort of explain what I would call conceptual stages. There's clinical stages for diagnosis and treatment. And that's things like looking at your hemoglobin A1C. If it's normal, let's say 5.5 or less, prediabetes, you know, about 5.6 and a little more than that. And then uncontrolled diabetes over seven. But what I'm getting at here is not this clinical diagnose and treat stuff. This is what I would call conceptual stages of diabetes for understanding the disease. Because by understanding the disease, you're more likely to motivate someone to try to get their act together and stop eating all this fat and maybe improve a lot. Fat belongs in fat cells. That's the only cell in your body that should be storing a lot of fat is your fat cells. And what I'm talking about here is white adipose tissue, not brown fat, which is a unique, unusual thing. All right, everybody has a different threshold for how much fat they can store. And that's why there's some skinny people that have diabetes because their body doesn't have the capacity to store much fat. So even though they really don't look that overweight, they've got ectopic fat in their skeletal muscle, their liver, and their pancreas, which has pushed them into diabetes. And then you'll see some other people who are really fat. By the way, their abbreviation for that is sometimes TOFI, which means thin on the outside but fat inside. There's also some people who are really obese, but they don't have diabetes. And that's sometimes referred to as bohe, like big outside, uh, healthy inside. Anybody who's fat's not really healthy, but they might not have diabetes or just metabolically favored in that sense. When we have a relatively fixed number of fat cells in our body, uh, there's a little controversy about that, but the gist of it is that when you excessively stretch a fat cell, it'll sometimes begin to leak fat into the blood. Sometimes that's called a spillover effect that fat can then go to other tissues. For example, especially next would be skeletal muscle or to the liver. You don't want fat in your skeletal muscle or in your liver. The average person does not want fat in those locations. Okay, um, you're not supposed to have fat. It's really important. Skeletal muscle, liver, or pancreas. Um, a high fat meal, you will get fat going into your skeletal muscle really fast. It gets there bigger and faster than does the glucose. And then what happens is the beta oxidation of the fat, especially saturated fat, it'll overwhelm the electron transport chain of the mitochondria in your skeletal muscle. And this will cause the electron transport chain to shut down. And then glycolysis, Krebs cycle and glycolysis will be backed up. In particular, the enzyme 3-phosphoglyceraldehyde dehydrogenase will be inhibited. What happens after that is you get accumulation of a metabolite called diacylglycerol, it means two fatty acids attached to a glycerol, and those will stimulate protein kinase C, which will block glucose, glucose type 4 transporters from going from the cytoplasm of the skeletal muscle cell up to the plasma cell membrane. So the bottom line is, you know, you don't really need to know all that fancy stuff, most persons. You just need to know fat causes a blockage of a skeletal muscle cell's ability to take up more glucose. And that's a really big deal because normally after eating, which is called being postprandial, you're going to take up 80-85% of your glucose in your skeletal muscle. They're the biggest organ in the body. And they kind of have an on-off switch. The skeletal muscle can store that as glycogen for future usage. So when you can't store the glucose in the muscle, you're going to get hyperglycemia, high blood glucose level. Actually before that, what will happen is the pancreas will crank out increased insulin to have more of an effect to push that glucose into the skeletal muscle, but it'll take a lot of effort. That can actually continue for decades. A person can be hyperinsulinemic before they become hyperglycemic. Okay, eventually though, they're going to start accumulating fat in their liver. And the accumulation of fat in their liver is a really big deal. Fatty liver is basically like saying diabetes of the liver. And tons of people have fatty liver. Tons. I mean, I can't even tell you how many millions of people over the age of 40 have fatty liver. It's super common. All right. Um, what happens then is the liver loses its ability to accurately sense the blood glucose level. And it'll keep running an enzyme pathway called gluconeogenesis even when it shouldn't. And the net result from that is it'll cause elevation in the blood glucose level when you're fasting. So that's fasting hyperglycemia. We talked about the post-meal, post-prandial hyperglycemia being related to fat accumulation in the skeletal muscle. It's often referred to as intramyocellular lipid in the journal articles. Uh, fatty liver, also called hepatic steatosis, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, um, or NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Okay, anyways, the accumulation of fat in the liver causes 
inability to turn off gluconeogenesis with result in fast and hyperglycemia. And that's partly also because you also have insulin resistance in the fat cells where they don't shut off lipolysis, break down a fat even though you've just eaten. All right. So normally the body is only going to burn two things. It's going to burn glucose in general and it gets that from glucose itself, like from starch, for example, or other minor sources of glucose. It'll also get uh, conversion of some amino acids into glucose. On the other hand, the body can burn fat. Fat mostly comes from eating dietary fat, but fructose gets converted primarily into fat. Alcohol, you know, two carbon units go right into becoming acetyl-CoA. So that's another major source for the body of fat. Then here is the final, you know, coup de grace where the person just continues to deteriorate. They're going to get accumulation of fat in the pancreas. And anybody who looks at CAT scans of the abdomen, you'll see tons of patients have all this fat, fatty atrophy of their pancreas. Yeah, it's because they got diabetes. Um, they'll get what is called endoplasmic reticulum stress, and they'll start to have misfolded proteins. They can't process the proteins inside of the beta cells. The beta cells of the pancreas are the ones that make insulin, and they start going into this deterioration pathway when the pancreas accumulates fat. It'll then lead to something called the UPR, the unfolded protein response. And if this continues and the cell can't manage it, as is often the case, they will then go into beta cell ap apoptosis. The beta cells of the pancreas will die. And that's a big deal because the person can't replace them. You can't replace the beta cells of the pancreas. So it's a really important, what should a person do? A person should stop eating fat. You know, everybody thinks, I know from a lot of experience, I've been a doctor 30 years, most people you're talking about nutrition, they think it's a big joke and they're so lazy and ignorant, they don't even open a book or go online to see, gee, in all these countries where they eat a plant-based diet, almost nobody has diabetes, okay? So you got to use your brain, and basically, if you stop eating high-fat meals, you eat a plant-based diet, especially starch-based diet. By the way, you're going to hear some young guys talking about eating a lot of fruit. You know, there's two guys who are real famous. I like them, actually. They're the Mastering Diabetes guys. I think it's Robbie Bittero and uh, Cyrus Wombata. I mean, they're smart, they're good, I like them, but when you're young, you're 20 years old, diabetic, you can eat a lot more fruit because you're exercising a lot more. You're more metabolically active, but if you're getting older and you don't exercise enough, then you probably can got to cut down on that fruit because there's too much fructose in it, even though it comes packaged with some nutrients and some uh, fiber. Uh, so. But the worst of all is if you're eating all this high-fat meat and you're also eating fructose, which is basically liquid fat. Okay, so anyways, what happens next then? So these were the stages. Fat accumulation in the fat cells. Fat accumulation in the skeletal muscles, number two. Fat accumulation in the liver, number three. Fat accumulation in the pancreas, number four. And then number five in this clinical conceptual stages. By the way, I just made up these stages based on extensive reading. These are not something you're going to find in any book. But the benefit of them is to understand and I've read tons of papers on diabetes. It's so you can understand the disease to have a better chance, because it's hard to motivate a person unless they understand why they're doing it. And you know, there's at least hope for a few patients. Most patients with diabetes have bad outcomes, okay? Um, so what's next? Complications of diabetes. When you cannot take that postprandial glucose into the skeletal muscle, it ends up sticking around in the blood. You get hyperglycemia. Not to mention, we talked about them simultaneously having a fatty liver and cranking out glucose from gluconeogenesis in the liver so they'll have a markedly high blood glucose level. Well, you've got a lot of cells in the body which do not have a way to regulate the amount of glucose they take up. So for example, the, the cells of the retina, of the eye, they continue to take up too much glucose and it basically has the same effect as we spoke about here when there's excessive overnutrition of fat going into a skeletal muscle cell they get excessive amounts of glucose coming into the cell because they can't regulate it. Because normally, a skeletal muscle, you turn it on and off. Sometimes you're exercising, sometimes you're resting. But you cannot turn off your eye cells, unfortunately. And they will continue to take up too much glucose. It'll overwhelm their mitochondria and it'll start to damage the cell. Because when you get a backup of these glucose intermediates, for example, 3-phosphoglyceraldehyde in glycolysis, it's right in the middle of glycolysis where it switches from a 6-carbon phase to a 3-carbon phase you'll then produce something called methylglyoxal, MGO, and that will have a tendency to subsequently form advanced glycation end products, AGEs, and that damages tissue all over the place. You'll also get a lot of reacti reactive oxygen species in this process of mitochondrial dysfunction. So that's how you get diabetic retinopathy. Same thing happens in the kidney. That's how you get diabetic nephropathy. 
Same thing happens in the peripheral nerves, especially in the legs because they're such long nerves and they're also partly ischemic and that's diabetic neuropathy. It also happens in the endothelial cells. Endothelial cells can never turn off. They're not like a muscle that can turn on and off when you're using it or not using it. Endothelial cells are constantly taking up whatever glucose is available in the blood relative to the blood glucose level in the blood. Okay, so what happens is they're damaged and you get this microvasculopathy damaging small vessels all over the body. That's why diabetics get so many amputations because they trash the small arteries in their foot and there's nothing distal to bypass to, so it just gets amputated. And they also trash the vasovasorum, which means the outer layer of the arterial walls all over the body. And they end up with tons of vascular problems. It's one of the most common causes of a stroke is because the blood vessels in the brain are being damaged. So anyways, in summary, this was a talk about the stages of diabetes and the problem fundamentally is too much fat in the body getting in the wrong places. And some people can have this problem even when they're relatively skinny. And you don't really know how skinny that is until you, you, know, you check their blood, you see if they're having a problem or not. But um, so what's the smart move? Minimize your dietary intake of fat. I don't believe in this good fat stuff. It's just a nonsense slogan to trick people into eating more fat. I think the Mediterranean diet also is a bogus slogan that just tricks people into eating more fat. You really want, if you eat a plant-based diet of whole foods, nothing processed, you're going to end up with somewhere in the ballpark of about 7 to 10% fat, and that's a good amount. Um, so anyways, that's a summary of the uh, stages of diabetes.